You are listening to Gospel of Peace, a podcast for kingdom women and everyone else about political theology and everyday faith. I'm your host, Rebecca. I am the editor of the Kingdom Outpost, kingdomoutpost.org, and I am a PhD student exploring how the gospel of peace transforms us in a world full of violence, nationalism, abuse, and more. I am so excited about today's topic because it really brings together political theology and everyday faith, which is what we are all about here. And today I want to talk about beautiful and joyful living, living out that way of peace. And just starting with the thought that I had last night, which I'll just read out to you because I was trying to fall asleep at, I think, 2 (laughs) a.m. graduate student life. And a thought came to mind that really, really played into, um, but not played into, like really was relevant to the concept of the gospel of peace. So I said, we believe that it is the beauty of life that becomes transformative. This is innately Foucauldian in the sense that power is not seen as something merely enacted by rulers, dominators, and penetrators, but as something that is diffused across human existence, flowing through different qualities of relationships and manifesting itself in different ways. Therefore, the kind of power exercised in lust, violence, and abuse is not the only kind of power there is. Freedom, peace, is not the assumption of such power. In fact, peace and freedom are enacted when we break free of the power of violence. We counteract violence by the agential exercise of a different kind of power altogether. The power of lust is confronted, not by the attempt to usurp and then wield such power violently towards good, equitable ends, but by confronting it with a greater and far more compelling kind of power, love. Love overcomes lust because lust rules by means of suppression. Dictators, abusers, they use control, guilt, shame, manipulation, deception, and the threat of violence. Love, on the other hand, does not bind us in chains, but draws us in, welcomes us. It is a place of refuge, a voluntary community. Community is the reason why peace is more powerful than violence and why brotherly love declares to the world that we are Jesus's disciples. So what this essentially is saying is that when we are a community of faith together, that itself is evangelism. That itself is a way of being the light. Now, this can be assumed in a very arrogant way, like I have the light you need and I have the message you need. Uh, But the reality is that we want to, we aspire to be light in darkness. We aspire to have God's goodness and righteousness and just ways in us to be the city set on a hill There is this exceptional aspiration. Doesn't mean we live up to it all the time. But this exceptional aspiration is there because we believe that there is evil in the world and there is harm and there is violence. And surely there must be something outside of that. We're not so arrogant as to claim that we are perfect, but we we want to believe that there is salvation we want to believe that in a world of sin and and all the horrors that we see inflicted on people by other people, we want to believe that there is a gospel of peace. And so the the own the main evangelism and the main testimony that we should have as Christians is simply that we celebrate life in a world that celebrates violence and destruction, stealing, killing, and destroying, that we enact community and love in maybe an individualistic and destructive world, 
and we we enact this we we create beauty uh the idea of beauty comes from the word goodness both in the hebrew and in the greek uh for example when it says god saw that it was good there is also the connotation that it is whole that it is something pure and in that sense in that sense of being good and whole and pure and positive we see beauty of course the natural world is incredibly beautiful creation declares god's glory it is beautiful and glorious when we go out we don't really go to like enjoy and feel relaxed in like an urban cement jungle full of a human trash we don't go to a landfill we go out to somewhere that has been untouched for example, um, go and climb a mountain, go and look at green uh, meadows, listening to running water. These are all actually things that are good for our mental health. Beauty creation is actually good for us, like scientifically proven to be helpful to us and that cultivates um positive emotions and all that and that is how God created it because when God created the world he said that it is good and Ephesians 2 says that we are God's workmanship created uh, to do good works which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them and that word good there is actually it, it also connotes the idea of beauty imagine this like we we see ourselves as created to do beautiful work. And the beautiful work that we do is in the context of empire. I truly think that as Christians, what we need to be concerned with to, to really living a different way from is the world's exercise of harmful and imperial power. This takes on many forms. It could be interpersonal relationships where there is selfishness where there is abuse or it could be in a, on a larger scale where there is stealing, killing and destroying war, um, colonization, uh, extraction, really just going invasion. And with that also comes a lot of physical violence and also sexual violence. And that's the thing, like what we... Um, what we in who have been saved from the power of Satan to the power of God, as Acts 26, 18 says, what we stand for is that we are in God's kingdom. We have been made new and we are to be made beautiful, to do beautiful works that all the world can see our beautiful life. And praise our Father in heaven. And Jesus said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, because you love one another. Love is beautiful. Whereas under the power of Satan, what we're looking at, as I talked about um, in the episode three, What is the Gospel of Peace? I talk about how there is so much lust and violence in the kingdom of Satan, that that is really what characterizes the kingdom of Satan. When human beings um, have the lustful and harmful desires that come from the evil one, Jesus said, you know, you are of your father, the devil, which is <laughs> like really, really blunt and really, really direct way to say. But I believe what Jesus is describing there is a life under the kingdom of of Satan and the power of Satan, where you want to do evil things because Satan makes you want to do evil things and harm things. And that goes against the nature you are given by God because you're made in God's image. Satan is destructive. God is creative. Satan is lustful. God is loving. Everything Satan's kingdom is ugly and destructive and about dominating. Everything in Jesus' kingdom is about beauty and it's about serving others and, and letting that love and service be a beautiful testimony. And it's not just a performance. It's an enactment of what should be true in and among us. And yes, absolutely, we fail many times. 
just by the standard of beauty is what is happening in in many church communities a thing of beauty when for example people are shamed uh people are abused manipulated uh, when there is an unhealthy belief about like Christian service and people get burned out because the this expectation placed upon them of how much they should give and serve. Um, I recently completed an article called um, Nourishment and a Nourishment in Nourishment and Care or something in a Wearing World. And in that article, I basically talk about the unhealthy beliefs about service and sacrifice that we have in the Christian life, that we take, we take something violent and evil that Satan wants to do to us, that is to harm us and kill us, martyrdom, and and we take that violence and evil and, and, and extreme suffering, and then we make that characterize the Christian life. That's kind of bizarre, and that is really, really harmful. Yes, we want to sell all we have and, and follow Jesus, but the kingdom of God is not just about a violent death. And it's not just about extremes of torture and deprivation. There must be something. Those martyrs, like in the early church who died, they died because they had something worth living for, not just because they thought an extreme death was the best that they could accomplish. The martyrdom of Christians is something that happens because of the evil world that we live in. It's not part of God's design. Now, Jesus said, blessed are you, rejoice, you know, and God, God treasures and loves the death of the saints. This is not to undermine sort of what Christians who have died for their faith um, have like the testimony that they have and the love of God that they have, which is so amazing. But why? Why did they do that? Because they saw the kingdom. They saw the beauty and joy and love and fellowship and community in the kingdom. And it was something like they saw the pearl of great price and they were willing to sell everything. But selling everything is not the pearl. See, we are mistaking those two things. And so... Today is really a continuation of that article where we have sort of taken martyrdom and wanted to make it sort of like a, a deathly life that we're supposed to lead. And that leads to a kind of asceticism. And in the article I talk about, as we've talked about on the podcast, misunderstanding what flesh means. So like, for example, uh, Galatians says, I think, if you bite and devour one another, now those are the way the flesh Bite devouring is literally abuse. If you abuse one another, you don't have the love of God in you. Yes, that is the desire of the flesh. That is giving into the flesh and the way of the flesh. Now, the flesh, clearly according to scriptures of things like the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life, or as James says, the desires for pleasure that war in your members. And because of that, you know, James says, you covet, but you cannot have. You murder and you steal and you do all these violent things. What is James saying? Those are desires that, that those are lustful desires that cause us to do harmful things. So that is what scripture clearly means by the flesh. And in, in a very consistent way, all the way from Jesus's teachings, like in John 8, to all the way to the epistles, it's very clear fleshliness is not about hating all things physical and material, like hating our bodies. Fleshliness is about doing the will of Satan, doing harm, being lustful. And there is a sort of separation that we have created between the physical and the so-called spiritual, between the body and soul slash spirit, and also between the secular and the sacred. So then we come up with this unhealthy culture that when a Christian needs to rest, it must be uber spiritualized. It must be Bible study. It has to be worship music. It has to be prayer. We can't be simple. 
and practical. But interestingly, this is very Grecian. This is very Gnostic. Paul says this in Colossians chapter 2. He talks about people who want to deny the body. He says, you know, don't touch this. Don't taste that. He says, these are all things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men, but have no value against the indulgence of the flesh. What Paul is saying is that asceticism is fleshliness too. Trying to trying to control the physical appetites or deprive the physical body is a form of obsession in itself. It's a kind of indulgence in itself. It's fleshliness too. And not only is it extremely self-absorbed to have this kind of view that the most spiritual things is like sit in your room and just meditate on the Bible all day. Really, the most spiritual thing, the active exercise of love is in community. That's why God is... That's why God is a trinity because love is God. God, you know, love exists in the Godhead. God is love and God wants us to be like him in the community and in the way that we love one another. The ultimate Christian life is the love that we have for one another, not hiding in a room and perfecting ourselves or perfecting some kind of ascetic pleasure in hours of like, you know, depriving ourselves food to, to be all disciplined. I mean, there is this whole kind of performative, striving, achievement-based aspect of the Christian life that we actually have taken from society, from imperialism, from the world. And then we have taken that and put that in a Christian life. And then we wonder why we're burnt out, why we don't have rest, because we're still conformed to the world and conformed to the way of empire, which is about constant accumulation, constant achievement, and constant productivity. Whereas, why can't we just simply be? Why can't we just simply love? I love um, two of these quotes that I shared on Twitter today. So I'm just going to read them out loud. One is Adam uh, Kiawe Manalo Camp. Um, on writing about Hawaiians. He says, missionaries thought Hawaiians were lazy because by noon, Hawaiians were surfing, doing art, socializing. What they didn't see was that Hawaiians started the day at dawn and were so efficient and organized that they were done planting, harvesting, and cooking for the entire day by 9 a.m. So what we have here is missionaries coming from a modernized, industrialized culture with this idea that you need to work from dusk till dawn and you need to uh, accumulate wealth and you need to have that kind of virtue and discipline to constantly be working and, and producing, accumulating, achieving. And instead, Hawaiians live in what we call a pre-modern uh, pre-colonized culture where they did work they did care for themselves but they also did so in a way that they could still enjoy life so they had different arts they had music they had community life there's so much more to life than just working and living in sort of the rat race in in this industrialized world where life just becomes about striving and striving and striving constantly. And then there's another quote here by Melanie Lau. And she says, Western cultures believe we must be alive for a purpose, to work, to make money. Some indigenous cultures believe that we're alive just as nature is alive. To be here, to be beautiful and strange, we don't need to achieve anything to be valid in our humanness. And just repeating that part, that you, if you're alive, you always have to work for something. You have to accumulate something. And that is the attitude that colonization or imperialism had towards the world as well, to nature as well. So just to go into a little history of the theory of it, um, when the Enlightenment came about, the Enlightenment produced in people the sense of, I want to conquer nature. I want to dominate nature and establish myself, humankind, as some kind of enlightened, in, in a sense, demigods, like powerful, 
modern enlightened in this whole kind of domination of of nature translated into what we call colonial modernity under colonial modernity we have the whole kind of well a greed based way of living frankly it's the sin of greed because we cannot simply live we cannot simply like be in sort of the Garden of Eden type of mindset, we think that we need to not just like work to survive because many, many cultures around the world do that. We need to gain. We need to go to other countries and conquer them. We cannot let the forest be the forest, the desert be the desert or the tree be the trees. We have to put it to work. We have to keep extracting, we have to keep taking, we have to keep accumulating. And then we think that somehow this, this striving, this accumulation, this extraction, this endless hunger will somehow make us satisfied, full and happy. The reality is accumulation does not make us happy. We put ourselves in the mindset of striving and never ever resting. And what do you think comes of that? What comes of that is a lot of destruction as we are seeing in the modern life. So the modern life is the idea that anything new is better than anything in line with this logic of conquering nature, putting nature to work, conquering people, putting people to work. Um, if, if restless striving is good it's progress it's modern and it's enlightened and it's what everybody needs so then um in embedded in the society that has this belief system christians then began to associate modernity with the superiority of so-called christendom or western civilization essentially and then goes on to the world and sees people who simply just live life who, for example, can live with the bison population, doing hunting as necessarily eating as necessary, eating as necessary, but not over hunting more than what you need. Then the problem with uh, why the bison population in America was utterly wiped out by colonists, why dodos were wiped out, is because people didn't just take what they needed. They they took as much as you possibly can so that you can get rich off it, so that you can sell it, and so that you can hoard treasure. Essentially, that's what it is. Proverbs 30, I think, has has this saying, the leech has this, uh, the leech says give and give. The leech is never satisfied. The leech is always wanting more and the thing is that when we live violently when we live in order to dominate which is the way of empire essentially it's a way of satan and it's very unhealthy and the more unhealthy it is unfortunately the more we will look for to try and fill that gap to cure the restless striving but the, the you cannot use restless striving to cure the restlessness and the strife you'll never find peace and that is the thing Pilgrim Marpeck the, in, in 1530 said that a lot, essentially war and violence come from property. And he's not just talking about like having what you have. It's about accumulation, protection, hoarding, greed. That is the cause of violence. Think of how much of war and violence in this world is, is the result of greed. People who have wanting more than what they need and wanting to take from others. I mean, just the whole uh, thing about like imperialist land acquisition. What I have is not enough. What is this? A bottomless lust. This is why lust drives violence. This is why lust drives war. Because you sit there with what God has given you, because God does, you know, he makes the rain, uh, he makes it rain on the just and unjust. He he sends sunshine and, and light to everybody. Everybody, many, 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 many people do have. But we're not content with what we have. 
Godliness with contentment is great gain, says scripture. So this is what I want to talk about today. That was a rather extensive introduction, but this is what we're dealing with. This is essential to peace versus violence, love versus lust. And this is found in the way that we must live, the way must we must approach life to to have that kind of appreciation of beauty and life of little things of community that we have great satisfaction in simplicity. And this apparently is a secret to happy living. Happiness. What is happiness? We think hedonism. We always we always think in that last mindset. Let's put it that way. We think happiness and hedonism are like constantly indulging, living in luxury, living selfishly. Let's all consider that imperialism. Let's consider that empire in the way of Satan, right? What does happiness mean outside of that? Because let's establish that does not make you happy. What does joy, happiness mean outside of that? What does it mean to be blessed? Last night, I was listening to an audio book of, uh, called The Little Book of Huga. And it's by someone who who works with this research institute trying to understand what makes human beings happy. And it's really interesting. Human beings are happy when we are not in this competition to try and achieve and to accumulate, when we are not trying to uh, live up in this consumer society that promises us happiness and this dopamine high if we keep buying things and accumulating things. And that, that, that's another thing. Like it's an endless cycle of, you know, the more you buy, the more you're happy for a moment and then you come home and your home is cluttered and messy and either you don't have that peace. And so you leave your home, you go out and you buy more things and you bring it home. That's how it creates a cycle of hoarding. It's a psychological thing. And the problem is that we are bombarded every day by advertising that tells us you are not enough. That is what advertising tells us, especially the beauty industry and women. You are not enough. They're not selling a product. They're selling a lust. They're selling insecurity so that if you buy this, you will look like that person. If you do this, you will feel happy and you will feel content with yourself. You are not enough and you don't have enough. You need to become more, to do more, to get more, to earn more, to spend more, to collect more, to be happy. So the happiness uh, research by this author um, essentially studies what in Danish culture makes people happy. And there could be studies of many different cultures. Tr currently studying, I guess, Scandinavian culture is particularly interesting for multiple reasons. One being that the weather is so depressing that people actively do things to cultivate their mental health and that actually comes from being satisfied with the with coziness with the little things in life with celebration with joy with community and as I listened to this book last night I was actually doing some sewing I was listening to this book and so many things hit me about the cultural sort of um, protest against consumerism and the so-called modern life, the progressive, uh, enlightened, civilized, industrialized life. So there's a rejection of clutter. There is a rejection of individualism. It's very community-based. It's about finding joy with others, not necessarily like in a huge group, but in a community that you cultivate and you build for yourself and you do bonding things with simple, small things like making sausages together, playing board games together, um, having a meal together and simply enjoying it, you know, savoring, uh, savoring simplicity um it's against competition so it's like so literally 
people will, if you bring in something argumentative or competitive, or you're trying to one up each other, people say, no, no, that's not huga. So they'll draw a boundary and say, look, this is not what happiness is, essentially. Happiness is not when we're competing and trying to one up each other and trying to like uh, live in like excess or like keep up with the Joneses and, and, and collect and build up extreme wealth. That is considered antithetical to happiness, which I think like currently I've been living in America for a year. Uh, I like have a lot of positive experiences with people, with communities, with friends. I think that a lot of people are rejecting sort of the whole keeping up with the Joneses thing. But I mean, you are bombarded in your face all the time on social media, Instagram, and now TikTok and Facebook with advertising, constantly trying to sell you something that you need because you are not enough, that you have to be as good as someone else or keep up with the expectation or follow that trend. Um, and and people are talking about it. I, I've listened to some talks on YouTube about how literally consumerism is destroying our mental health, is destroying, like it's literally waste. There's so much excess and waste so much of what is bought, if you re- you buy something for someone or you for yourself, you don't like it, you try to return it, it doesn't get returned. It most often gets trashed unless it's resold. Uh, and people cycle through things, decoration, clothes, uh, trends. Trends are the source of so, so, so much waste. And there's this whole thing about like branding. There's a whole thing about uh, I mean, just that, that level of clutter and accumulation is actually bad for mental health. Uh, and that is what this author found, found in, in the Happiness Institute and wrote about in the little book of Huga. Um, and so instead of individualism, the focus is on connection. And also the focus is on simplicity contentment, connecting with nature and rejecting sort of that domination and modernity thing. I think the difference between between sort of these ideals and, and the necessary critiques they make in modern life and our mission in the kingdom of God, which is a distinct thing, we are to cultivate and to be known for living a beautiful life for being community-based people, loving one another, caring for the poor. That is what the early church was like in the dog-eat-dog world of the Roman Empire. The early Christians celebrated life and they celebrated simplicity and sharing. They literally were a people of celebration because they got together and they had feasts. Now, they could be very simple feasts. They may not have been very, very um, lavish. But think about the the fall of the Roman Empire towards the end, where people were so greedy that they would have eight course meals and they would make themselves, uh, I don't know, it's like, I remember reading about this in some history book, but take care of the grain of salt, but there was so much uh, greed that people like tried to throw up, throw up so they could eat more and just eat and eat and eat. And that the gluttony, the horrific gluttony compared to the simplicity of contentment and satisfaction in celebration the early church uh became known for art interestingly they would have catacombs and they would paint beautiful things in the catacombs uh they would celebrate each other's lives even in death and so they would be they would take great care in burying each other and in decorating tombs there was such a celebration of life and the early Christians would go out to the dung heaps of the city, the landfills, and they would look for abandoned babies. And they would either bury them or they would adopt them. There are actually tombs that for rescue children that they adopt. And they would, they would celebrate what little life there was. I mean, that is absolutely amazing. In a culture where if a child was born a woman or born disabled, which to them was the same thing, the Roman law held that the father 
had the legal right to determine if that child should be ra- live and be raised or not. And if not, the child would be what you call exposed, essentially abandoned. So there was this ruthlessness. There was a lack of celebration of, or appreciation or sanctity of life in the early Romans. Um, and this was done by wealthy and privileged and powerful people, which is why, according to Rodney Stark, if you go to a some of these ancient Roman graveyards, most wealthy families did not have more than two daughters. Despite, you know, the number of sons they had, they would always have a small number of daughters. Why? Because they were killed. And so Christians were very different from society around them. They they were people of celebration in the midst of violent persecution. We think of the early church as being lots of people who, you know, died in the Colosseums and all that. But what about the simplicity of the feast, the table around which he said? Now, I'll probably do a podcast on the book, uh, Subversive Meals by R. Allen Street, about what the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, really symbolized and directly said, like the, in the context of the Roman Empire, where the Lord's Supper was literally a political statement and a social statement. It's an enactment of a completely different way that of the kingdom of God, that of peace, very distinct from the way of Caesar and imperialism and war and hierarchy and benefaction and patronage and control and slavery and all the things that were going on in the Roman Empire. So what is the way in which Christians ought to live? We are to be people who create beauty. I have an article about this um, called Kingdom Womanhood. She has done a beautiful thing. Coming from that verse where Jesus praises the woman who washed his feet and says, she has done a beautiful thing. What if we thought about goodness as being something that's beautiful? Because it is, and also because it kind of means that too. So what if we think of like Matthew 3 verse 10 is saying, every tree that does not produce beautiful fruit, good fruit, you know, inherently good and whole fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Or let your light shine before others that they may see your beautiful deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Uh, or 2 Corinthians 2, 8 verse 21 saying, For we are taking pains to do what is beautiful, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of man. Why? Because like those who see the quality of the Christian life, of the way of peace, that should be recognizable. We should not have to say this gospel that we have teaches righteousness. It should be evident. It should be evidenced in us in the way we live. First Timothy 4 verse 4, for everything God created is beautiful and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. Or 1 Peter 2 verse 12, live such beautiful lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your beautiful deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. What is very clear in scripture is that beauty and goodness as a quality of our lives and our testimony should be evident. And it will be evident because people can always recognize goodness. There's always that quality in human beings. And what society live in, there's something, if they see that, and they might have it too, because they are they have God's image in them. Um, but there should be that quality that is recognizable. It could be something that people want or something that people identify with as a value. So as I talked about in terms of like imperialism and colonial modernity, that there is something there that we have especially lost in our modern consumers, industrial societies. And just like the concept of Puga, there's that recognition of that. Why? I believe that embedded in us is that desire for good and that recognition of good. That is why uh, that is why many cultures have this knowledge and appreciation. Unfortunately, where I come from, my culture, we come from a very, very, very colonized society. And I feel like in many countries that is lost. Now, in in Europe, in the West, there's actually an appreciation of nature 
there is an appreciation of things like green fields and natural living and farmers markets and you go to Europe or you go around North America that there is something there you know people tend to live lives that are a lot more connected now if you go to Asia which is hyper industrialized a friend was telling me that she was in Cambodia when there was a flood that was like 20 years ago and it devastated her to see that because of the flood waste was everywhere and plastic waste had absolutely destroyed the landscape. Um, in many cultures in Asia, there there is that simplicity that is entirely lost. And you live in a culture that is almost entirely built around success, striving, accumulation, and it's a very, very, very artificial world. You can imagine that that is very bad for mental health, and it is. Levels of suicide among children are very high in some of these cultures. Children are getting depressed because the minute they're born, they're put in this race towards success and achievement and accumulation of wealth. For example, in a society like Singapore, um, Hong Kong, Korea. Um, now, in on the flip side, of course, you know, uh, like in Japan, for example, there could be that on one hand, but there's also that appreciation of something very similar to Huga, which is connection with nature, sort of uh, Zen Buddhism, where they they retain some of that pre-modern values. But you see the cult of modernity and the cult of industrialization, consumerism, and wealth. That cult has been the religion that has been spread in Asia. And it is very, very awful. Like if, if your entire existence simply revolves around competing, striving, never being satisfied, never feeling that you're good enough, uh, the stress levels among children is skyrocketing. And it, it, it's crazy and insane. So th there is this loss. And so that you can see it in the culture and you can also see it in the way of life. If you compare village life and people actually consider those who live in villages and who live in simplicity um, to be lazy. And whereas if you listen, live in a city and you have a corporate job and you have a huge bank account and you live in some penthouse, then you're successful. But if you live a simple life, you appreciate family, community, music, you know, all the natural, simple things. And you live in a way that is very much peaceful because a destructive consumerist lifestyle is a violent lifestyle. If you live in a way that is peaceful, you're considered lazy and backwards and primitive. And so what people try to do is they go into indigenous villages in my country and they try to take the children out of the villages. And to be fair, what happens is a lot of indigenous people are literally malnourished and starving because their land is being taken away from them and their livelihood is being taken on them from them by the encroachment of like illegal logging. Again, greed, stealing, destroying, killing is literally happening. Uh, external forces have eroded their way of life. And people think the way to save them is to retrain them to belong to modern society. And so they're like, why are these people so lazy? They just enjoy gardening and and playing in you know the forest and in the woods and they need to be sitting in a school for um you know eight hours a day studying and they need to be imbibed with modern values so that they would want to be successful and accumulate money and guess what that lifestyle is not happiness unfortunately in my culture almost everything is like sort of like the minute uh, modern life, co colonialism and industrialism and industrialization touched us. We're like, we want that, and we're gonna work on that. We're gonna, we're gonna be the best at that, that we can be. And so, in my culture, like in literally every aspect of the culture that that is so called traditional, uh, basically success and wealth are the only measures of uh achievement, success, wealth, productivity, all that causes a lot of alienation. You're alienated from yourself. You grew up in this thing where you 
you're told you must work hard so that you can be rich one day. That That's all that children's lives revolve around. Play is a bad thing. Uh, anything like and anything in life that revolves around monetary success is a good thing no matter how dead it is no matter how much you hate it in fact better the more you can work at something and overwork at something you know like children it starts with studying and then adults it comes with it, it comes to working uh the more that you strive you do things out of discipline for the sake of that long-term goal of success and wealth and prosperity and power uh then the the better that is it's sort of a dead alienated life and that was the cultural value that i was imbibed with because uh because that was in the culture growing up uh i would say that personally i like my parents took us out of that. So I went to a school where that was that was basically the culture, like dead studying, mindless studying for as many hours of day as you possibly could so that you could get as many good grades as you possibly can because you want to be rich. That was, that was it. My parents said, that this is not life. This is not a good way to live. You're going to be very unhappy and you don't have time to be a child and to play and so they took us they took me out of that school and they homeschooled us because they said childhood should be a time of play time of joy or spending more time with your family you should not have to be like working 12 hours a day doing inordinate amounts of mindless work um this is not the value you want we want you to have and this is not the life we want you to have <laughs> so the the funny thing is that that way of um that that upbringing was probably better for my academic life in the long term because I really love learning and to me it's a very life-giving thing writing studying going to college are all like amazing and such a privilege um so that is just to say that there are people in this world who live in a very artificial world and who live in the rat race and in the trappings of that rat race and don't know anything outside of it. So something like Hugo, something like the way, the what is described of how Hawaiian people naturally live, that is just so alien and outside of that. And I've seen that. So... I want to summarize about 21 descriptive characterizations of what, what beautiful living is for Christians. But before that, I also want to mention one thing. And I was going to mention it earlier and then, you know, got off on a different <laughs> on a different train. But the difference between the mission of the kingdom of God and just simple, basic, joyful living in a culture is that we in the kingdom of God do have a mission. Now, we are not to be, we're not alive simply to perform, achieve, or strive. It is about simply being, to, to be in community, to love, to live. But the difference is that we are not conflict avoidant. And that is something that psychologists have said is, is slightly problematic about Huga, which is that it's about preserving peace as the absence of conflict. And so people just don't talk about um, things that are potentially, that, that potentially kind of bring a little bit of strife or conflict into the environment. And we talked about in a previous episode about toxic mas masculinity, where, for example, in Anabaptist culture, Peace is seen as the absence of conflict. In a different podcast, my friend Jeremy Yoder actually talked about that in the context of Mennonite culture, where peace is seen as the absence of conflict. For Christians, peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is the enactment of our very stance of conflict against the evils of violence. So we are not simply to carve out havens of peace. We must we must. So take a stand. The way of peace is taking a stance and then drawing a line that empire does not cross. 
Now, we must recognize that within our communities, yes, violence happens, abuse happens, and we constantly, we cannot let our guard down. We cannot become complacent or prideful. Absolutely. And so that is part of what we must be vigilant against as well. But that's why the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary walks about like a devouring lion. We are in a battle. But the way that we fight the battle is with peace. We overcome evil with good. We overcome evil with beauty. And so what we are doing is that we are standing here. We're taking the stance. And this stance is a rebuke of empire. It's a rebuke of evil, of violence, of imperialism, of conquest, of exploitation, of extraction, and all that. There is sort of like a... It's 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 a peaceful revolution. It's an it's an aggression by means of love. It's it's a peaceful revolution. That's what the gospel of peace is. So we're not simply just we're not simply trying to look at everything that is going on in the world and just create a happy medium between everyone, just like uh. Well, you want to conquer that person's land and you are the one being conquered. So let's try to find middle ground. Let's try to find like, you know, there's some equivocation. There's 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 genuine uh, merit to both sides. And so let's sit down, try to get everyone to meet in the middle. Conflict avoidance, pacification, appeasement, and an equivocation are all things that are inimical to peace. And we need to realize that. For example, we think that peace and reconciliation means getting an abuser and the person that they harmed on the same page. That is not the same page. I mean, that is not our goal. That is a harmful goal, in fact. We are not trying to draw... We're not trying to to create compromises, middle grounds, and do whatever it takes to keep the peace and end strife. Peace is going to be uncomfortable to what is evil. Peace is going to be considered aggressive. Peace is going to be considered disruptive. Why? Because peace is a quality of, of something good that we are standing for and evil cannot, cannot allow it to exist. If a light shines in the darkness, the solution is not to try and reconcile light and darkness. The solution is that light, the light penetrates the darkness and the you know that's what it says, right? The light shine. Uh, he's the light of the world. Light shines in the darkness, and darkness cannot comprehend it. The light penetrates the darkness, but in a good way. Not in. in I mean, the, even the word penetration is so imperial. It relates to imperial history. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has to flee. So we have to make a stand. It is. It is living in community, loving in community, being people of the gospel of peace. We do a lot of wholesome and good things, but we cannot be silent about what is evil. That is why in my articles, for example, the recent one about nourishment in a wearying world, I do not stay silent about evil and abusive and harmful theologies and writers. I don't only say positive things and people think if you only focus on the good, you'll never have to deal with the bad and it'll and that will speak for itself. No, I see truth as being in a hand-to-hand -hand combat with evil. I see light as being in a hand-to-hand -hand combat with darkness. The kingdom of God as being in a hand-to-hand -hand combat with empire. And that is why if they're evil and harmful and abusive theologies, you're not going to hear me be quiet about it. I will bring them out and that may be uncomfortable and it may upset people that something that they really appreciated or thought was good can turn out to be harmful. So we must not be silent about harm. We must not be silent about abusive theologies, about abusers, and we must not be conflict avoidant when it comes to the issue of abuse. We think that if we only say and do good things, and if we don't 
if we avoid that conflict with evil, guess what? You yourself will perpetuate evil and do evil and you will perpetuate violence and do violence. That is what happens when uh, when someone who is harmed goes to the church and speaks out and then they are silenced because that's not a good message. It's not a happy message. How dare you suggest that something isn't right? Draw a line that empire doesn't cross. Stand up for what is good and right and beautiful. Dovtioski says beauty will save the world. Well, guess what? We have, we literally have to take a stance for beauty. If not, we will be swallowed into ugliness too because it is deceptive. Satan comes dressed as an angel of light. It will come right into your church communities and you have to deal with it and you cannot run away from that fight. And you cannot try to have this facade of wholeness if there is abuse going on. So I'm, I'm really passionate about the subject. So being people who care about beauty and goodness is not people who bury our heads in the sand. But let's talk about what the qualities of that are. And I thought about this in relation and response to listening to that book last night. Firstly is wholesomeness. This includes mental health. This includes the quality of what we live for, um, which is wholesomeness. Wholesomeness being equivalent to beauty, goodness, and love. Do we live wholesome lives? Second, simplicity. Rejecting clutter, rejecting strife, rejecting the pursuit of excess, choosing to live in simplicity uh, means, well, basically it means living more with less. This is a book by Doris Jensen Longacre. It's a very um, Anabaptist concept and and she talks about what this means, living in a world that's very much about waste. And she talks about, uh, for example, how the economic system is tied to economic wealth and, and success and prosperity is also tied to uh, exploitation of labor <clears throat> and also with global conflict, strife, political uh, struggles and all that she says <clears throat> five ways we should live we should do justice we should learn from the world community we should nurture people cherish the natural order and non-conform freely and so she has these two books living more with less and the more with less cookbook and one author has called it sort of the best articulation of Mennonite theology there is because this is what it is the early Anabaptists truly believed in simplicity some of them believed that they could not be merchants because if you were a merchant selling bread and other people need that bread to survive if you took money from something that you didn't do honest labor for, which, which as a merchant, you're basically reselling things. You're not putting honest labor into something that was dishonest. And that was something an Anabaptist could not do at that time. And I'm not saying that like, yes, there's labor involved, involved in like distribution, selling and all that. Many Anabaptists today have businesses. But back then, there was something about the rise of mercantilism and the rise of like the pursuit of excess of capital of wealth that the Anabaptists are like, this is destructive to communities. This is destructive to uh to love, to it's harmful to my neighbor. Something is wrong here. And so the concept in Cologne, uh concept of Cologne, which is an Anabaptist statement from Cologne, Germany in the 1600s, essentially said that Anabaptists believe in plain clothing and in living simply because they condemned uh, greed. And let me just find that statement because it just, I think, captures what essentially Anabaptism should be, what, what plain living should be about. And maybe the essence of that, the meaning of that has actually been lost over time. So this is statement number 16, which is about separation from the world. 
The freedom the merchants exercise in running their businesses tends to increase temporal greed and the fashions of dress resemble more the ways of the world than they do the way of Christian humility. Pausing here, remember that one of the lusts is the pride of life, like the way of the world is pride. A lot of this pursuit of success and, and excess and wealth is so that we can stick our noses in my in, in my neighbor's face and be like, I have a bigger house than you. So the bigger house doesn't make you happy. It just makes you feel like you're better than your neighbor. And so like it's an egotistical thing rather than something that's about happiness. Let's continue. Since these sins can creep in unnoticed, and since it is to be feared that the same will bring damage to many souls, and since it is not easy to set exact standards in this regard, how much profit a merchant may earn and what a person is to wear, we still desire that everyone be content with a modest profit and simple clothing. Pausing here, uh, clothing back in the day was also a symbol of social status. And so plain clothing back in the day for Anabaptists, what that really meant was that you did not dress any higher than that of a peasant. You Plain clothing meant peasant clothing, simple clothing, inexpensive, because you did not want to try to aspire to some kind of high social class. So let's continue. Uh, I'll just repeat that because... We still desire that everyone be content with a modest profit and with simple clothing, indeed in every way proving oneself to be a light to the world, neither following the fashions of the world nor comparing self to those who are insatiable for ever wanting more and more. It was agreed in this regard that all guardians of God's household are to warn their people in all faithfulness to and empowered by the word that they remain pure and escape from the corruption of the disobedient in this manner. In this manner, one member is to admonish and warn the other in a kind-hearted way so that the admonition might be all the more agreeable. So this is about contentment. That's awesome. So simplicity. That should be a value. Wholesomeness, simplicity. Thirdly, care. Care and gentleness towards one another, towards the world that we live in towards every single thing because we are to be caring and gentle people that is essentially a fruit of the spirit um fourth i would say it's intentionality intentionality in the way we live here's another book a good book as well from an, and about this rich christians in the age of hunger and living more with less i recommend them got this got this from three books and this was free um at a bookstore no cost at all that's awesome um so intentionality living slowly rather than living in a race taking time to enjoy simple things in life i just love that if it's winter i will try to go out for a walk and enjoy what greenery there is and enjoy the weather it's uh, it's the sun is shining today um enjoying a little thing seeing a flower one flower stopping to appreciate it living with that sort of intentional grateful mindset living slowly um the author of the book about Huga talked about how appreciating the effort and the process put into something. He talked about getting together to make sausages with friends and the sausages weren't really bad and they couldn't eat it, but they really enjoyed the community and the process of it. Uh, it talks about the fact that they value food that you put time and effort into, like a stew that has been bubbling on the stove for several hours. and it just bubbles slowly, it develops richness and flavor, or a sourdough that has been really slowly growing. So there isn't that anxiety and stress or, or that cheapness of uh, instant food, fast food. The opposite. So basically what they say, it's more slow food is more satisfying than fast food. And on Instagram, there's this trend, uh, trending audio that talks about... Uh, the effort-driven reward cycle, which is essentially the more effort you put into something, the more that you get out of it. Effort meaning intentionality, not strife. You should be clear about that. Like if you slowly knit a sweater, 
yeah, you could go and buy a sweater. But what if you knitted one? Every time you put it on, it will fill you with so much joy because of the amount of effort you put into it. Or you make something for someone. You make a loaf of bread or you sew them something. They're like, this is precious. This is special. In a world that I could go to any store and buy a hundred sweaters, someone took the time and made one for me. How special is that? Um, care. Intentionality, uh, fifth being comfort, celebrating comfort and coziness and um, homeliness. Now, the interesting thing is that when we try, when in our modern mindset, we try to be ascetics, which is we try to think that any kind of pleasure and comfort is hedonism which is that is excess, okay? Excess is hedonism, but simple pleasures and comforts are not. That is actually contrary to the Judaic mindset. In Judaism, caring for the wellness of your mind and body, doing simple things, simple rituals, like for example, the Sabbath. The Sabbath is meant to be a time of connection with family. It is seen as sacred, not because it's something that's like pious necessarily, but, but also because it is something comforting and joyful. It's about enjoying something with your family and really savoring and treasuring that. How amazing is that? Uh, there isn't this conflict between the sacred and the secular in Judaism. I, I think I mentioned a little bit about the sacred-secular divide, but that is just to say everything in your life, from your work to the meals that you eat, can be sacred, intentional, and done to the glory of God. This is scriptural. Whatever you do, do to the glory of God. Do it out of love for God. And even caring for yourself can be something you do out of love for God, love for your neighbor, love. It's living in a way that is loving even towards yourself. So I, I was so impressed, um, you know, just by that, that ethics that you see in Judaism. Um, for example, Orthodox Jews are not ascetics. They don't believe that the more suffering that is, the more godly it is. They believe that the more celebration and joy there is in between, you know, there is mourning, there is sadness, there is repentance, but joy and just, just uninhibited joy, like dancing at a wedding or dancing at, um, what is that celebration called? When they dedicate and celebrate the Torahs. Um, at the end of the high holidays. Simcha Torah. Simcha meaning happiness. Simcha is a positive attribute. But Christians like, no, no, don't be too happy. That's unspiritual. Be blessed. Be joyful, which is a spiritual kind of happiness that comes from reading your Bible. Nonsense. Find joy in making a meal and sharing that with your family, for example. Find joy in providing comfort to yourself and to other people. Uh, so next six would be celebration. That's another characteristic. Joy is another characteristic. Eight, safety. Safety is very, very, very important because we don't care about safety enough. And the really interesting thing is that Huga is about a place where you feel mentally safe. And so anyone who creates a lack of safety, uh, who makes people feel anxious, stressed, uh, competitive, or insecure, that is not huga. So that is interesting because we Christians really need to be to care more about creating spaces of safety. Emotional safety, mental safety. I mean, we... We profit so much from condemnation and shame and we use that to control, belittle, and abuse that we don't think about what it means to be a haven of safety for one and for one another. Oh, and something that came to mind earlier when I was talking about the early church and the care that they put into things. Did you know that originally the reason why they had to have male deacons and female deacons is because deacons dress the body of church members who have died they were essentially undertakers but it was a sacred and beautiful and intentional thing they would very lovingly 
gently wash and prepare bodies for burial. That was the that was the duty of a deacon. And I have a, more in my article uh, about kingdom womanhood, about being a home and a haven for one another, being a place of refuge, of and and safety for she means that you are you don't bend over backwards for wolves that you don't try to be a wolf tamer that you don't try to be a, a safe haven for predators and wolves you have to take a stand for safety and safety like there there is a reason why we need the good shepherd and the good shepherd creates that place of safety we are to be havens and uh, of refuge for one another we are to be places of safety and trust and to do that we must absolutely carry our rod and staff against uh, that which is abusive, violent, condemning, manipulative, uh, harmful, that which destroys others' emotional health, physical health, and so forth. And that is why we have to be uncompromising in calling out what is harmful. Safety. Next, creativeness. And also connection with the world that God created. And it's interesting, right? Happiness science, as I said, the more the more we're the closer we are to respecting to living with nature, the more natural and sort of uh the more we appreciate what is natural, the more we live in a way that's natural, the better it is for us and our mental health. Next is community and family. I think that's something that like most traditional cultures had because God put that in us. Whereas the world today has created so much individualism that those who suffer in some way, whether those who uh, suffer financially, mentally, or physically, those people with disabilities, all suffer because we are taught to be entirely self-reliant, self-made, and to live in a world where we only look out for ourselves. Whereas if we live in, a, in the, if we live the community life, and if we truly see one another as family, if we live as brothers and sisters in the kingdom of God, that's going to change. If we live to love the least and last and lowest. And to be among them and to be a community and a home for one another in this place of marginality as Christians, that marginality means being outside the values and power structures and privileges of empire. And this includes the Christians in the early church who are very wealthy, but who chose to share this with other people. We will have so much joy and we will be living so much we will be so much more healthy too next is nourishment whether it's food clothing i mean think of dorcas making clothes uh, for widows and putting not just not just like distributing things she put love and care and effort into that or think of jesus washing feet the fact that Jesus not only cares about our eternal soul, but also our stinky toes is pretty amazing. I don't think he was doing it merely for some other worldly spiritual reason. I think his disciples needed washing and so he did it. Like there was a practical value and a practical use to it. Jesus said, if you see someone hungry, feed him. As for whatever you do to the least of this, you do to me. And Jesus talked about what? Feeding, visiting someone in prison. Uh, I was hungry. I was thirsty. I was, you know, people who are alone, people who are in need, love them. Be my disciples. Do the will of my Father in heaven. Follow my teachings. So this is essence of what it means to be a Christian, which is nourishment. Um... There's also like that sense of creativity of the intentionality you put into doing something with your own hands. Now, First Thessalonians says, live quietly and work with your own hands. Let me actually just find that verse first because it's pretty awesome. And when I read it, it just it just struck me so differently from like the over pious 
uh, alienated kind of spirituality. So mind your business and work with your own hands, Paul says, so that in your daily life, you may res win the respect of outsiders so that you'll not be dependent on anybody. And be dependent, what it clearly means is being like, not so much that we're not to be interdependent, which we are, but we're not supposed to take advantage of other people, which Paul tried not to do. He he tried not to take advantage of people. And maybe that was something that he he had in his head that he needed to do that. Uh, that was Paul, you know, he he will make his own tents, but and he won't ask anybody for anything. But really, reality is, think about it, Paul ministering to the Corinthian church and not taking anything from them, let shelter, care, or whatever, um, and, and maintaining so, sort of that separation distance. Imagine, compare, compare that to the church, uh, the, the Philippian church, that their care for him abounded and they ministered to him even when he was in jail. That is Christian love. That is the gospel. You might not demand it, but that is something essential to the gospel. The thing is the fact that so many women follow Jesus around providing for him. Uh, these were relatively wealthy women and they were essential to Jesus' ministry because they provided food and they were essentially like sponsoring the ministry and they were an integral part of it. And that was to their privilege that they were. And that is also a sign of like, oh yeah, the Philippians caring for Paul or the women caring for Jesus. That is a sign that the kingdom of God is here. Okay. um, Working with our own hands, promoting what is healthy and beautiful, uh, promoting what is peaceful, restful, being generous, stewarding wisely being sort of having that quality of homeliness i mean the early church met in homes that was a quality of home life that was very important we alienate and i think when we make it into an institutional thing rather than a home thing like i think that if you have people gathered around a table there's something in that structure the very the very makeup of the room that you are in that creates community and that invites participation. Whereas putting a church in a building and having one person up there on a stage and on a pulpit destroys that sense of community and elevates that one person literally on a tier above everyone else and, and, and puts them on a pedestal. When really 1 Corinthians 14 describes, you know, everyone is a psalm, a hymn, an edification, an exhortation, maybe a rebuke. Ah, everybody contributes and everybody belongs together because it is a community. And it's really interesting the part about holiness because in the Huga book, what essentially happens is that people actually enjoy hanging around in the comfort of home more than they do going out somewhere. I think this idea of like going out and buying something or, or buying entertainment or buying a meal, that all uses a lot of money and also that creates barriers of access. And also there's a lot of distance. There's just a lot of like, if you go out for a meal, it's so expensive that you can't provide, like you can't give something to someone. You each pay for your own meal and then you go home. And that's kind of, that's such a different quality from like when I visit friends and I cook for them and we have a meal and we sit around and we laugh and we eat many different desserts and we eat big pots of um, stew or curry or pie or, um, it, you know, it's, it's different. I think it's the way that we choose to live that really... Some things make for happiness and some things don't. Going to a restaurant, paying that like, you might really enjoy the food and companionship, and that's really good, but not everybody can afford that. And to think I need to achieve that in order to belong somewhere or to fellowship with people. What about just opening your homes and making a meal or having something where everybody brings something? Um, interestingly, the Hoga book says that it is. It is something more egalitarian, meaning more community-based when you have like a potluck and everybody brings something. There's a quality of home and love and care that is unrivaled. And it's not elitist and it's not exclusionary. 
So stewardship, holiness, contentment, these are all things that should call, that 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 make for happiness and joy and community and beauty. So I hope that this episode has really been sort of joyful and inspiring to you. As I said in the beginning, all these things should be that quality that draws people into the kingdom of God. Not necessarily like, oh, the church potluck is so amazing. But I mean, it does make a difference when the church is more home-based and community-based and when the people bring food and where there is that place that you can have these conversations and, and physically and tangibly love one another. The early church, I mean, in the book of Acts, they were like f- providing food to widows and they were eating daily from house to house, breaking bread daily from house to house and celebrating and <laughs> just being all around kind of joyful, happy people. So um, I hope this gives you food for thought or is encouraging to you. Uh, I just enjoy thinking on these topics. So maybe we'll talk about this more on the podcast. You know, what does it mean to live a life of celebration as a Christian? Authentic, authentic, authenticity being central to that. Um, let me just write that down. I have a long list of like scribbled words down here in my notebook. Authentic celebration and community life and intentional living and all of that. Just, this just fills me with excitement, you know? I it, it really gives me energy when something doesn't cost a lot, doesn't seem very fancy, but it's special and it's um you make a lot out of a little there's that creativity too and that deep sense of satisfaction so i uh really this is kind of a long episode so i'll sign off for now and i'll say i'll see you guys soon for another episode of the gospel of peace discovering what peace means in our everyday lives have a joyful week